It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another exciting edition of Q&A with the coach. You're excited, right? 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 Anyway, on with the questions. Our first question comes from Romeo, who says, Ramsey, what do you do about your chest hair? Well, I don't do anything about my chest hair. I just have hair growing out of my chest and pretty much everywhere else on my body, and it just sort of exists. So, wait, there's more to this question. Romeo says, I'm hairy like you, and if I shave, the stubble burns my BJJ partners. Okay, well, there's a simple solution to your seemingly complex problem. Right, you got some chest hair, stubble grown out, scratching up your training partners. Nobody's happy about that. But guess what? Get yourself a rash guard like this one from our friends at xmarshall.com. And you can use my code RAMSEY10 for 10% off everything on the website. They make some really cool stuff. Once again, that's xmarshall.com. Now, shameless plug aside, what does a rash guard do for you? Well, it's a close-fitting, stretchy spandex shirt that covers you that protects your skin, but also if you got stubble or chest hair or something else that the, your training partners don't want on them, it's a great way to keep your training partners safe from that too. So get yourself a rash guard. Go check out our friends at xmarshall.com. They've got an amazing variety of rash guards, spats, shorts, and other fight apparel and training equipment. Next question. Our next question comes from our friend one in the video who says, Is Sambo the best suited martial art for MMA today? Well, I suppose that depends on what you mean by Sambo. Do you mean combat Sambo, which has very, very similar rules to MMA? Do you mean Sambo the grappling sport, which is in a lot of ways very similar to Judo with some major and some minor differences? But let's talk about combat Sambo. Probably the biggest difference is the kurtka, this uh, this jacket, right? And it's very similar to a judo or a jiu-jitsu jacket, but it's got these shoulder pleats, which make a nice grip, and you can use some different techniques that are not possible in a judo or jiu-jitsu gi. Now, I love sambo. I've trained with a lot of sambo practitioners from, Sormer, from the uh, former Soviet republics, from Russia, Ukraine... Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, all these countries ending in Stan. And these dudes are different. They're different, not different techniques, not per se different training methods, but a different training mentality. And, and that, is, that is one major difference, which is they win by outworking you, outworking you in the gym and outworking you in a fight. And I've seen a lot of these, uh, these Sambo practitioners have a lot of success in mixed martial arts. Guys I've trained with, guys that I've trained, and the world at large is starting to see some of these guys in the UFC right now. And it's kind of blowing their minds like, what? There's, this, there's a whole bunch of people on the other side of the world who are really good at this sport and we had no idea? Well, surprise. <laughs> yeah. Mixed martial arts has been a thing in Russia for a long time long time since way before the UFC well is it fair to call sambo mixed martial arts kind of I mean the term mixed martial arts was coined by John McCarthy the, you know the original UFC referee and well, actually no he wasn't the original he was uh, he was brought in for UFC 2 I believe anyway we'll just call him an OG UFC referee and funny story about that. There's an interview. I've been looking to try to find this on YouTube. I saw it a couple of years ago and I haven't been able to find it since because he's given so many interviews. Hard to find this stuff. But John McCarthy was explaining how the sport started to be called mixed martial arts because back in the day they just called it either cage fighting, ultimate fighting, or NHB, no holds barred. And he was filling in some paperwork when they were getting the UFC registered with state athletic commissions and they had to fill in a blank what is the sport called and he said well martial arts because the idea was that the ufc was a venue that any type of martial artist could compete in under a very broad rule set or lack thereof but they said what kind of martial arts 
And off the top of his head, John McCarthy said, mixed martial arts. And so the name stuck ever since. So combat sambo, really cool sport. I'm, I'm a big fan. I, I enjoy it. I, again, I've practiced with a lot of these guys. And there are certain tendencies that sambo fighters tend to have that you don't see so much in their Western counterparts. One is a penchant for attacking your legs, especially with the straight ankle lock and the Achilles lock. And so you, you learn very quickly, watch your feet. And if you're not watching your feet, they'll take them home with you. But yeah, can we call combat sambo a martial art? Or is it simply a sport where martial artists compete? Because MMA, I had a discussion with, with our friend Sensei Seth. We did a podcast together addressing this question. Is MMA a martial art or is it a sport? And I said, well, it is a sport where martial arts are on display. Just like boxing is the sport of pugilism. Pugilism means striking with the fists. And you, if you really want to be pedantic, you could, you could distill boxing into a bunch of different martial arts or styles of boxing. Like if you look at the way a lot of Russian boxers train or Ukrainian boxers train, it's, it's subtly but importantly different than the way, say, American boxers train or British boxers train or Cuban boxers train. At the end of the day, it's all fisticuffs. Right, it's all punches and head movement and footwork, but it's different, right? I mean, if we can have a hundred different styles of karate where they kick and punch and do kata and wear the gi, and we can call those different martial arts, then can't we call Cuban boxing and Russian boxing and American boxing and British boxing different martial arts too? Why not? Anyway, I love Sambo. It's great. If you are a skilled Sambo fighter, you're going to have very little difficulty transitioning immediately into mixed martial arts. If you've competed exclusively with the, the kurtka on the jacket and the wrestling shoes and the headgear, you know, take that stuff off and get used to competing without it because small differences, even something as small as a pleat in the shoulder like this as opposed to, say, a jacket without the pleat, can make a big difference. Like a huge one. As soon as you change one tiny detail, ooh, man, that can be exploited or used to a tremendous degree for or against you. Next question. Our next question comes from Mark, who says, what are some obstacles you've had when you first started coaching, and how did you work around them? dealing with different learning styles, experience levels, goals, etc. Do you put everyone through the same curriculum as if they're going to have someone across a ring or cage at some point, or do you take a more lax approach to casuals that don't aspire to train? Did you receive any flack from other local opposing coaches, and how did you handle that? That's like 17 questions, man. Well, let's address this uh, second to last question first, the penultimate one. Do I take a more lax approach when training casuals as opposed to fighters? Um, no, actually. Training casuals is a lot more work than training professional fighters. It really is. It honestly is. If, if you have not had the experience of coaching fighters versus, say, uh, training casuals who have no interest in fighting. It's the difference between night and day. And those are radically different things. What's the difference between being a coach and being a trainer? Well, the coach facilitates the success of an athlete. And a trainer trains people to do something. And there is some crossover sometimes. A coach can be a trainer. A coach can be a teacher. But it's one of those bugs and insects type of thing. Not all bugs, not all insects are bugs, but all bugs are insects. See. So that was a lot of questions. But yeah, you can't take a lax approach to casuals or they're going to get hurt and it's going to be your fault. So you got to step up your game if you think that. 
This last question, did I receive any flack from other local opposing coaches when I started out? How did I handle that? I, I received some constructive criticism from some local coaches when I started out. I started my first gym, the first gym that I opened up was a small gym in Murray, Utah. It's a suburb of Salt Lake City, and not too far away. That's where Jeremy Horn had his uh, elite performance gym in Sandy, Utah at the time, which was not too far away. And uh, when I first started making YouTube technique videos, I put one out, and it was about a triangle choke escape. And Jeremy Horn left me some firm, constructive criticism. And it was strongly worded, but it was fair. And he essentially said, look, the way you are teaching this technique is not correct. If you persist in teaching like this, you will get somebody hurt. You need to change this. You need to change this. You need to change this. Educate yourself, basically. And that was great advice. Now, the little, the, the little proud ego part of me didn't like hearing that. It was like, right? Every time you get a, an angry comment or a, a negative comment or a harsh sounding comment about your technique, it doesn't feel good, right? I got a comment earlier today about a recent video about uh, front kicks and what part of the foot to use when using a front kick and there was a guy with a, a picture of a Wing Chun dummy on his uh, profile picture who left a very, very angry comment saying, this is sloppy and bad and you should feel bad about it. Shame, 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 sir. And I remember thinking, all right, this, this is just a bad comment. Like, there's no constructive criticism, just like, bad, bad, bad. But that's not what Jeremy Horn did. Again, he, he did me a solid. He left constructive criticism. Constructive means it builds you up. And it builds you up in the right way. And it points you in the right direction, which is exactly what, what Jeremy Horn did. And, man, I love that dude. He's an awesome guy. And, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it flack. Flack, getting flack from people, that's, that's people trying to give you a hard time to make your life harder. And I, I had some conversations with um, with a few of the other coaches in the area, and mostly positive. Because while, while essentially we're all training fighters to compete with each other, we understand we're all pushing each other forward. Now, I got a lot of flack from the non-coaches, from the casuals. From casual saying, hey, man, we've seen you fight. We've seen you be beaten before. You're not that good. What makes you think you can be a coach? Got a lot of backlash on the internet from, from casuals, from folks who didn't fight. And a couple who did. But what did I do? I got out there and trained. Got good. Got better. And specifically at the art of coaching which again is a radically different thing from fighting. So what are some of the obstacles I had when I first started coaching? The biggest obstacle when I first started as a coach of the sport of mixed martial arts was setting up my gym on a very, very small budget. I made a whole video about this, how I started my first gym with 50 bucks and gradually expanded upon that. Probably a more compelling question would be, what were the obstacles I had when I first started coaching in China? Because in the U.S. it was pretty easy because, you know, I had, uh, there was interest already. People knew what MMA was. There was, there were a lot of gyms, there were fight shows there, a lot, bunch of pro fights going on all the time in the area where I lived. And so it was pretty easy because the groundwork was already set up there. But when I came to China... There were no MMA gyms. Nobody knew what UFC stood for. Nobody had heard of the sport of MMA. Even if you translate it to Chinese, nobody knew what the heck that was. And so being a coach 
without any infrastructure for your sport or any awareness of your sport at all, man, that's a major challenge. Huge challenge. And I remember saying at the time, like, man, it's going to take, like, at least 20 more years before we even, even see a, a Chinese person in the UFC. Fortunately, man, these, uh, these Chinese fighters, to their credit, proved me wrong and did it in, uh, in less than a decade. Because, man, the hard-working folks, when they get out there and train, they get stuff done. Hard work pays off. But that was the biggest challenge. Coaching in China for the first time. The complete lack of infrastructure and awareness of the sport. So essentially, it wasn't just a matter of coaching or teaching or setting up a gym. It was trying to educate the public about what this is and why they, they should even care. And I probably ended up investing just as much, if not more, time into that than actual coaching. Do I put everybody through the same curriculum? Uh, no. No, everybody has different needs. If I'm teaching a group class, which I do, then yeah, everybody goes through the same curriculum. If I see somebody struggling with something, yeah, we'll, we'll take some time out to address that issue. If I'm coaching individual fighters, yes, I'm, we're going to take a very individual approach to that. If we're doing like a private lesson with, some, with, with a casual who, who is not uh, interested in fighting, then we'll address their specific needs and questions. Pretty simple. Thanks for the question. Next. Our next question comes from Captain Chaos, who says, Since modern martial arts lack a belt system, have you tried other ways of giving the student some indication of progress. Well, I've made a few videos about why I think belt systems for mixed martial arts are kind of dumb and they shouldn't happen. But to answer your question, do, do I do something to acknowledge progress in my students so they can feel like I have progressed, I've reached level two, level three, whatever it is? I don't give out gold stars. I don't give out little checks. I don't give out belts. I feel that's completely unnecessary. If a fighter is consistently winning fights, he's doing good. If he's consistently overcoming obstacles that were previously difficult, he's doing good. How do you get that feedback? Well, do you spar in your gym? Because if you don't, you'll never know. If you do, you get a pretty good idea of where you're at. So what the heck do you need a belt system for? You can tell right away as soon as you lay hands on another person how you measure up to them. Although, there are some exceptions. Sometimes you'll lay hands on the other guy and you'll feel like, yeah, I can take this guy, my technique's better, etc., etc. But then, over the long run, he outworks you. And this is frightening to a lot of people who've never experienced it. A guy who's able to outwork you and outpace you. And no matter what you throw at him, you can't stop him. Man, I had the experience recently of sparring with a dude over at the UFC Performance Institute in Shanghai. He, he was the only Chinese fighter to win his fight and win a contract with the most recent uh, edition of Dana White's uh, Contender Series. Like all the other Chinese fighters ended up losing. Um, man, what's his name? Um, he's got kind of a weird, weird name, like non-Chinese name transliterated into... into um, into Mandarin, um, it's going to be bugging me. But anyway, this this dude, he's, he's pretty tall, similar in size to me. And, um, you know, I start sparring with him the first round. It was like, okay, you know, nothing special. Second round, I realized he's outworking me. Like, he's not slowing down. He's not wilting. He's not fading. He's just consistently pressing forward and building and building and building. And that's exactly what happened in his fight, man. He even used one of the same techniques, like, well, when we were grappling, um, sorry, when we were sparring, we end up in a clinch, and I reach for a collar tie, and then he reaches for his own and 
jumps up and boom, flying knee right to the heart. Oh man, that was, <laughs> that was game changing. And I was like, oh dang, that, that took the wind out of me. That took the fight out of me. And he used the same technique in his, uh, in his fight on the contender. Anyway, that was, that was interesting to see how, in spite of the fact that his opponent came out looking technically superior and, and stronger in many ways, you know, this guy just outworked and outpaced the other guy. So that's, uh, that's important, man. So do we need a belt? Do you need a gold star? There, there are a lot of casuals out there who are like, well, I'm never going to fight. So I feel like I should have some sort of reward, some sort of indication so I can tell my friends, hey, I'm a black belt in MMA or whatever, whatever the case is. And eh, If it gives you the result you want, and that's the right way. If you want bragging rights, okay, fine. Get your bragging rights. Go brag. But as for me, you don't need to brag about anything. Next question. Our next question comes from Niccolo, who says, Why did everyone agree that biting should not be a thing in MMA? It could really change the outcome of a fight, and it doesn't seem to give horrible consequences like poking the eyes or kicking the groin. I'd love to hear you reflect on this. Thank you. All right, Niccolo, biting? First of all, that's gross. As far as horrible consequences? All right, there are horrible consequences on both sides. You bite, you're literally tearing chunks of flesh off of a person. And you are getting blood in your mouth, spreading bloodborne illnesses. It's as much of a liability to the person doing the biting as the person being bit. What else is wrong with that? Let's say you're sinking your teeth into someone and they jerk away and your teeth are still firmly embedded in the flesh. Now you don't have teeth. And those teeth are stuck in that dude's leg or whatever it was you're biting. Do you really want to watch the Ultimate Biting Championships? A combat sport where people are biting each other. Man, go watch Animal Planet or something like that. Go watch, like, crocodiles hunting reaching up out of the water, grabbing animals, dragging them, and if you like seeing biting, go watch some nature documentaries. I don't really understand that question. Why did everybody agree that biting should not be a thing in martial arts? Because, man, because. Nobody likes getting bit. Next question. Asa Yagami says, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? Dude, stop eating candy and get out there and train. Next question. Our next question comes from Michael. This is not a martial arts related question, but it's an interesting one. He says, does stuff made in China really suck like so many Americans over here think they do? The products you have in China, where and are they made? And do people over there think they suck as well? Okay, here's why Americans think the Chinese products suck. It's because American industrialists who import stuff from China import the cheapest crap that they can get their hands on so they can cram as much of it as possible into shipping containers and then get into the, into the U.S. And, and turn the biggest profits, which is why, generally speaking, you see the worst crap in America that's made in China. Is it all like that in China? No, no, not at all, man. Not at all. In China, you can buy pretty much anything, really, that's made in China. And you can buy low-quality stuff, you can buy high-quality stuff, you can buy fair to middle and stuff. But why don't you see... Why don't Americans tend to see high-quality Chinese-made merchandise? Well, it's simply because Americans aren't importing that stuff. They're importing the cheap crap to turn the biggest possible profit. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Sometimes I'll go to, uh, you know, different uh, websites and I'll notice they're, they're selling stuff that's made in China that I recognize and I recognize the Chinese price tag here in China and they've inflated it by like a hundred times. I'm like, there's no way anybody's going to buy that for a hundred times the, the uh, retail price. <laughs> that's ridiculous, but people do because they don't realize there's an alternative. Yeah, China makes some really good stuff. 
like they're doing some excellent, excellent work with electronics right now. Um, you can get some awesome training equipment that is Chinese made. I've got some, some great boxing gloves and MMA gloves, you know, shorts, fight apparel, etc. that's made in China. But again, why don't you see the good stuff in America? Specifically that reason I outlined before. Next question. Our next question comes from Straight Gene, who says, Are cheat meals really necessary? No. And we could end that question right there, but he wrote a lot more. He says, I mean, most people eat junk food, do they? Do they? I mean, think about it. One third of the people on this planet don't even get enough food, period. I don't think they're eating junk food. They're just not eating enough food. And then another third of the people on this planet are subsisting on a very, very low calorie diet. Not because they're dieting, not because they're trying to lose weight, because they're poor and starving. So most people are not eating junk food. Most people don't have access to the basic food that so many of us take for granted. But anyway, he says most people eat junk food or are not super or not super healthy food on Sundays because they feel the need to eat things they like once a week. Now, if you always eat clean or healthy food, do you need to eat more on a cheat on cheat meals day, or can you just ignore it completely? I don't understand this idea of of uh, cheat meals, man. And it, and it goes back to this video I made a while back about vacations, where I said, "Live a life that you don't need a vacation from," and it's the same thing with your food. You can eat healthy and delicious and wonderful food. Good food doesn't have to mean tasteless and bland and bleh that you feel like you need a vacation for, that you feel like you need to eat some junk food to compensate from. And if that's the position you find yourself in, guess what? Guess what else you can watch here on YouTube besides a talking head video like me? You can learn how to cook. There's some great videos about how to make delicious food that is not crap, that is not junk, that is actually good for you. So besides getting out there and training for martial arts, if food is a big concern for you, get out there and train how to cook, how to prepare your own meals that are satisfying, that don't leave you wanting garbage in your life. Have the kind of diet that you don't need a vacation from. Next question. Our friend Bupesh asks, what should be the depth of learning MMA for self-defense? Well, I've said many times on this channel, self-defense is a legal term for using violent action that would otherwise be illegal and justifying that in a court of law. It is not the actual violent action itself, but rather the justification thereof. So how does MMA and self-defense coincide? Well, look... Mixed martial arts is a combat sport where you become the danger. Whereas self-defense is try to remove yourself from the danger. If you want to justify that in the court of law, you try to essentially use the, the bare minimum to get the job done, if you will. So they're, they're polar opposites in many ways. Self-defense, get away from the danger. MMA, go toward the danger, be the danger. Ah, oh, smash, destroy, etc. Right? There are a lot of things you do in an MMA fight which just go way beyond self-defense. There are a lot of videos. One I saw yesterday of uh, there was a, a jiu-jitsu black belt ended up in a street altercation. A guy attacked him, not knowing this guy was an expert grappler. And the jiu-jitsu black belt took him down, took his back, and held his back, didn't injure the guy, didn't strangle him, just, just held the back and talked him down until it became apparent this was no longer going to be a, a uh, violent situation and then let the guy go on. And, and they went about their way. Right? Nobody got hurt. So that, that's perfectly justifiable self-defense. And those are, those are skills that certainly come into play in combat sports, being able to take somebody down and control their back and control them so they can't hurt you. But MMA takes it a step further where you go in for the kill. Now the referee's going to stop you if the guy ends up unconscious or if the guy taps out. 
But essentially, the mentality is you go for the kill. You do that in a self-defense situation. It's no longer self-defense. You're now the perpetrator of violence. You just, you just murdered someone. You just strangled somebody to death. So good luck defending that in a court of law. Because self-defense isn't just defending yourself from the bad guy. It's defending yourself in a court, a court of law. So, do hand-to-hand -hand combat skills come into play in self-defense sometimes? Do you learn hand-to-hand -hand combat skills in self-defense? Absolutely. Do some of these skills cross over into the self-defense realm? Yeah. Do all of them? No. As far as self-defense goes, MMA is often too much for some situations and too little for others. For example, if one guy who doesn't know how to fight comes up and starts giving you trouble. You know, the skills like that jujitsu black belt had, the ability to take him down, take his back, and control him until the situation is under control. Great. That's enough. But if he follows through like it's a UFC championship title fight and beats the guy into a state of unconsciousness or breaks one of his arms or strangles him to death, yeah, that's too much. Here's a situation where MMA training is too little. Guy comes out with a gun. He's ten feet away from you. What's your MMA going to do against that? Nothing. How about this one? Three guys with knives come up. And they're trying to stab you. Eh. I mean... It's better to be an athlete in that situation, so at least you have a fighting chance to run away and get out of there, or push kick a guy away and try to make some space, but again, it doesn't address that specific situation. It's always better to be an athlete. It's always better to have hand-to-hand -hand combat skills if you need them. Is that the end-all be-all? Nope. Next question. Our next question comes from Short and Formal, who says, Hey, Coach, do you think there's a problem in MMA where coaches don't throw in the towel? Did you know throwing in the towel in MMA is illegal? It's a foul. And if you do that, the fight will be stopped, which is kind of the point of throwing in the towel, but I just thought I'd point that out. Throwing in the towel is a foul. Hey, that rhymes. But let's read the rest of this question. It seems to me that there have been a lot of fighters where fighters take a lot of unnecessary damage because their coach refuses to throw in the towel when their fighter is clearly getting outclassed. With my experience watching boxing, seeing a coach throw in the towel isn't a super uncommon appearance. Many boxing coaches consider it protection for their fighter so that they can get better and not sustain any more damage. They could be career-ending or even lethal. I rarely see an MMA, MMA coach do this. Do you think there is a pattern of not throwing in the towel in MMA? Is it a cultural issue, sport and if it is a problem, how do we go about fixing it? You know, as I was reading this question, I was thinking about all the boxing matches I've seen where the fighters actually died, where the coaches should have thrown in the towel. So it is it is kind of ironic that you point to boxing as like, oh yeah, we throw in the towel in boxing when we need to, when clearly that, that hasn't been the case. Yeah, the good coaches will. They'll protect their fighters when they can, if the referee is not doing his job. And let me, this is the point I want to emphasize if the referee is not doing his job. Okay? The referee's job is to protect the fighters. To stop the action as soon as one of the fighters is no longer able to intelligently defend himself. And there are some referees in the UFC who have earned the nickname If He Dies, He Dies for not stepping in sooner or letting beatdowns continue excessively but at the same time deaths in MMA compared to deaths in boxing significantly lower there have there have been very very few deaths in sanctioned mixed martial arts like very few in boxing every year we hear about at least a few of them now Are the numbers comparable of boxing athletes and MMA athletes competing in their respective sports? I don't know. I'd have to look into that. But 
We're probably watching some different fights. I, I imagine you're writing this question after watching a fight where there was a brutal beatdown where the referee probably should have stopped the action. And he didn't, and the corners didn't throw in the towel. If so, I'd be curious to know which, which fights you were watching. Does this happen? Yeah, there are some bad refs. There are refs who feel like they should just let the action continue for as long as possible, intervene as little as possible. And yeah, I understand this. I do understand that. But um, at the same time, don't step up when they need to step up. And it, it's a tough job. It's a, it's a tough job. Everybody underestimates the difficulty of being a referee. I've done it. The first time I refed, man, it was, uh, it, it's tough to make the right calls at the right time. It's easy to be an armchair expert. It is difficult to be in the cage and to make these career altering calls on the spot, on the fly, based on a simple visual cue. It's tough and it takes a lot of practice. And unfortunately, unfortunately, it takes a lot of practice, and referees are going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. So I'd say that's more of a referee issue than a cornerman issue, but as far as cornermen or coaches that don't throw in the towel when they should, as you put it, I suppose a lot of these guys that you've seen who've done this Maybe they do it out of financial incentive because they get a small percentage of the fighter's purse, and if he wins, he's basically winning twice as much money. And there are some corrupt, evil people out there managing fighters, actually quite a few of them. Quite a few of them, so fighters, future fighters, potential fighters, oh, be very, very selective about who you have in your corner. And make sure you can trust them with your lives. Not just your career, but with your life. Because fighting is an inherently dangerous sport, regardless of what type of fighting, whether it is MMA, boxing, kickboxing, etc. It's an inherently dangerous sport that may, and sometimes does, result in serious injury or death. Next question. Our last question comes from Austin who says, as a recent victim of the MMA YouTube rabbit hole, I was wondering why elbows aren't used very often in takedowns. Elbows used in takedowns? Like using your elbows to initiate a takedown? Or hold on, let's read the rest of this question. Is it due to the 12 to 6 elbow or spine hit rule ineffectiveness or some other reason? Oh, okay, you're talking about using elbows to stop a takedown. <sighs> Look, if somebody is in on a good takedown. I'm not talking about a crappy amateur bend over at the waist and break your own posture type of takedown that you see these, these uh, crappy internet self-defense experts demonstrate their, their brilliant elbow self-defense nonsense on. I'm talking about a real takedown, right? Like a UFC level takedown. Guy shoots shoulder to the hip, posture unbroken, and he is working to put you on the floor. You're not in a position to land an elbow 12 to 6 or otherwise. You're just not. And if you try to make the space to, to land an elbow, you're going to end up on your back. That takedown is going to be finished. I mean, try it. Try it against a decent wrestler who has a working knowledge of the sport of mixed martial arts. Try it against a trained fighter to land an elbow on them to stop a takedown. And even if you nick him with a strike, and this happens all the time because you will eat some strikes on the way in for a takedown often. Does that stop it? Not against anybody good. <laughs> Fighters know how to take a hit. right? They're not going to stop when you poke them and be like, Oh, oh. Oh, a fist just landed on my face, my poor, sensitive little face. Oh, oh, he just elbowed my back. I'm just going to stop and crawl into a hole and curl up into a ball and cry now. <laughs> that simply doesn't happen. Fighters are a lot tougher than you think. 
And again, if you are busying yourself trying to make space that you shouldn't be making, you're going to give the other guy the opportunity to finish that takedown even easier. Thanks for all the questions, guys. If you have questions for future editions of Q&A with the Coach, just leave them in the comments down below. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train. Brought to you by xmarshall.com. Use my code RAMSEY10 for 10% off everything. That's xmarshall.com. High quality training gear and fight apparel. And since everybody always asks if you have questions that you want answers to, just leave them in the comments below. I read your comments, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Enjoy this groovy music. Now get out there and train.